snow settles over the black forest. The dark trees put on robes, arms raised like obedient children. Their sleeves slowly whiten. Here's a stone cottage hidden from any traveler. In the derelict, ice-glazed front garden, a weathered wooden statue greets visitors. The Epicureans have gathered. This is their night. As a novelist, what you get to do, you think here, take note, mm -hmm. look at this, and you get to immortalize it in a way um, because why it gets to live forever in, that, in the that, book you've written. And, and of course, that's the question. Why do people write? Why do I write? I never knew a single writer. That, I knew there was a guy that edited the Dotham Eagle who lived on the other side of town, but, but what was a writer? I had a first story published in the, in the uh, little newspaper, my name under it, into class, into the week, loud clanging lockers, noise. I'm walking down the hall and Billy Snell, who in the eighth grade was six feet four, he stood up and in this foghorn voice as, as I walked by in the corridor, he, he hollered down the aisle, there goes Charles, he's a writer. And man, was I a writer. I planted these trees. They are my my handiwork. And the beetles take out that layer around the edge where they grow and it kills them. One of those um, Star Wars like transporter. And just imagine that with uh, fighting rednecks dumping beer cans over the edge and, <laughs> and uh, puking girls holding their own head back over the edge. There is a scene at the end of the Epicureans where they open a bag and find some, some barbecue inside. You asked if I had any feedback and I told you I felt like there needed to be something surprising. Do you remember what, what you a heart. put in? It was a blackened... Burned. It was a burnt, spicy, blackened heart. Did I do that? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Where does a thing like that come from? I don't know. Why that? Why that? In, you know, from this hand. That's the mystery. You know, there are more, there's more than one mystery. It's not just about that big mystery. It's about a lot of little mysteries and why, they, why the, the choices are there and what uh, hunches or intuitions or prohibitions you, you, uh, you carry around that kind of guide the, the littlest things that you do. My brother pulled up the tractor and he went around back to detach the bush hog. And, uh, and he looked down and a rattlesnake had struck him. And the rattlesnake's fangs were impaled in his ankle. There are snakes everywhere. You, they're asleep now, so you guys don't have to worry about them coming out. I could ask you these questions. I could get on a Zoom call. I've held my tongue because I wanted there to be a sacred moment of, of having that exchange. I didn't know it, it would happen you know, here in a field, you know, what, what? but I know it needed to happen somewhere exactly like this. Well, and that's your journey too. Yeah. It's not just me that we're, that we're you know, really talking about here. These, those are the walnuts I was telling you about. And I don't like doing this with walnuts because there is a tincture inside of the, uh, an oil inside of the green that stains your hands and it will stay stained. <laughs> Good you luck. You can't wash it off until the skin goes off. Oh goes my off. goodness. I had a weird bifurcated kind of personality of hating mess as a child. And yet I'm irresistibly drawn to it all the same. And I, I want grit and I want, I want it and I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want, I want jagged edges, and I want uh, arthritic, you know, looking tree branches. I love this fern that grows on these uh, on these trees. It has a, a unique name. It's called a resurrection fern because in dry weather it turns brown, 
and it looks like uh, it's scraggly. And then every time it rains, it turns green and revivifies and, and, uh, and is resurrected. Do y'all smell smoke? Something is somewhere on fire. And don't go in that house because that's where the cracker man lives. And they said, who's the cracker man? And I said, well, he was a man who was so skinny that he looked like a skeleton with skin on the bones. And all he ate was soda crackers. You like fire ants? Do you remember fire ants? So this is a, a historic cabin. My daddy found it on a piece of property. Uh, I, I always felt a, a juju in this cabin. Mm. See that charred place? An eight-year-old child was in front of the fireplace and her nightgown caught on fire. And she came running out to the house and she fell against the wall right here, ablaze. And, uh, and she died, it killed her. And this charred mark here and that one there is the remnant, uh, I was told by my dad, of, uh, of you know, that accident that had taken her life. Hey, Cracker Man! Every single kid is fascinated by a monster. The power, the gigantic proportions of them, and the strength, and, and the mystery of them, and the sense of, of being able to control things yourself, that you believe in yourself that one day maybe you can have those kinds of powers. And, and uh, that's my theory 101 of why kids like monsters, and especially this kid. So when you hear me telling all these details about the bugs and the plants and what lives out there, and I came out of the woods, I'll show you the old house on Parish Street. And you can understand the great gift of my life was a hundred acres of woods behind the house where I really grew up uh, for, for 12 years. The number of dirt clods that have been thrown on this street are beyond counting. But this is Parish Street. There was a baby born in that house who matured perfectly well up till about eight months, and it never grew another centimeter in its life. When it was 15 years old, it was lying in the crib and um, with a beard, but this size. Okay, see the door on the side? See, see the blue door on the side right there? It was not part of the fun and games. I saw that thing, that apparition, and I've been ridiculed ever since. I, I solemnly swear that I saw with my own eyes in the path where we buried our pets, a wolf-like, dog-like figure standing on its hind legs, wearing cut-off blue jeans with frayed edges so that they looked irregular, and a white t-shirt like people wore uh, their PE shirts at junior high school with its red tongue lolling out of the side of its mouth and, 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 and looking directly at our, our back door. Come on, Directly at. No, no, yeah, don't smoke that. This is where the kid lives who was bit by the monkey fella here whacked me across the knees with a, uh, the shins with a pole once. I believe my leg was broken. It still hurts to this day. In this house, the lady of the house, um, during the time we lived here, she was drowned, uh, they say. But does a drowned body float? Not that I know of. But this is where my life was lived right back there. When you look out into the woods and you look at the snarl on the trees, um, 
what is the emotion that that settles over you when you look at that landscape? Looking at this blank alien wall of green, it's kind of foreboding to me. It's like you once lived here, but you left us and you're not part of this anymore. That's what I really feel. Chicken wire flows in the big parade. Marching bands and prom queens wave from an old home. Alabama 1959. This is where I come from. This is the Wiregrass area, it's called in Alabama. Hey, Carol. We're at the Thirsty Pig, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I was, you know, I was ready to, to go to a fist fight with every other publisher to make sure that I was the one who got to bring the Epicureans to life. And so it's a privilege to be here and to launch this book. If it sells 10 copies or 100 copies or 100,000 copies, um, it's a masterpiece. Um, and I don't use that word flippantly. And it's a story I feel like you built for for all time, you built a... What a thing to hear. All those ghosts come back alive. With their final toast, the Epicureans will watch as the chef is strangled to death before their eyes. Charles and I worked together at Paste Magazine in Atlanta. That's where we first met. He was the book's editor. And I was, you know, just a little scrub. He had just written a short note and said, you're the real deal, Charles McNair. And that kind of encouragement, you know, writers, you know, we have, we're incredibly insecure and we're also too big for our boots at the same time because we feel like the world needs to, <laughs> to read our words. Uh, but that meant a lot to me and said a lot about this man is that, uh, you know, he knew that there were new writers coming up. And at that point, I never thought in a million years that I would, you know, be publishing my own books. Uh, never mind having the incredible um, opportunity to publish you know, an author as accomplished as Charles. And it really is the magical ingredient in what makes his work so special because there's no duplicating the kind of unique DNA of a place like this. Secrets must stay secret. And if you want to know what happens, you have to read the book. When I read the Epicureans, I, I see a reckoning with appetite, a reckoning for, with wanting more, with, um, yeah. and, and the, the darkness and the kind of noble aspects of, of that. The desire to be forever remembered in some way. Yeah. Is, is it vanity? Is that vain? Or is that, do other people have that? But I see people eaten up with trying to do things that will make them be forever stamped on the, on the face of humankind. You know, I want that. I did want it. I still want it. Um, is, I want it too. <laughs> What is Snake Creek and what is Hurricane Creek? Snake Creek is Hurricane Creek. Okay. <laughs> this, is where the ki this is where the kids came and played. The, the meditative quality of this place, uh, it, that Zen thing where they talk about where you're the, it happens in writing. You're writing, all of a sudden you look up and it's dark outside and where have you been for these two hours? You've been just there. No time, just in the moment. There are sections of some books I have no conscious memory of writing. None. I couldn't tell you how it happened, what what it, what happened. That's when it's good. That's when the writing is, is uh, the story is telling you. One foot here. Limestone. 
You call that rock skipping? All the way to the other side. Yeah, man. Yeah. Do you write a book to, for other people to be entertained, or did you write a book because you're trying to figure out the path you came on and, and the path that's ahead? I think your life just embodies the fact that pain can soften and pain can open up and pain can cause something unexpected to grow. Uh, you're talking about my characters too. This is a, uh, a significant place for me. This is, I, I just love the whole metaphor of it. The water's running together and, uh, you know, let's have a baptism <laughs> as I Wait go down the to the river <laughs> to pray, carrying about those good old days and who shall wear a crown of gold? Oh Lord, show me the way. Oh, brother, let's, let's go, go down. down. Let's, let's go down. Come, come on down. down. Oh, brother, let's, let's go, go down. down. Down to the river to pray. <laughs> if you want to catch a crawfish, this is the place. If you're a raccoon, and you want to wash your food before you eat it, like a, a little bandit gentleman, this is where you bring it. Raccoons wash what they eat before they eat it. Kelly gasped. She had never heard human fists strike meat, the savage animal noises of boys in combat. Both bled, both breathed hard. They squared off, then they charged one another again. Get him, Danny. I couldn't tell you one thing about the fights I won, but I remember every lick of the fights I lost. And there's something so deeply true about that and the South. Why are they fighting? Kelly yelled it again helplessly looking around at the faces for an answer. Poor, overweight, badly named Daisy Lay spun to face Kelly. Why are they fighting, she hissed. They're fighting over you, you stupid cow. If I didn't believe in bibliomancy before I do now, <laughs> why are they fighting? My favorite author, Frederick Buechner, said that of the seven deadly sins, anger was the most fun. <laughs> that you get to lick your lips over grievances long past. It's a feast fit for a king, uh, but the unfortunate aspect of it is that it, at the end of the, the feast, you realize that the skeleton at the feast is you. Ooh, the, the thing you have devoured brilliant. is brilliant. Brilliant. yourself. Hey, Mom. Hey, Daddy. You know, if you walk through here uh, on the winter solstice this day, and you listen to the wind that's blowing in off that river right there, what if each grave issued a little puff of smoke, like a little soul, and the wind caught all of them, and here they came blowing, caught in the trees, blowing over the land, going over the crops, going through the towns, and that's what the stories are. And the more stories you tell, the better you remember. 